All right, everybody. Welcome to our live stream. I am joined by Bullets for Bucks. He's normally on my live streams, but normally he's remote in. He has flown up from Wyoming, and uh, we are talking about our caribou hunt, and, or his caribou hunt. Uh, so, uh, first of all, uh, you want to reintroduce yourself to everybody or whatever? Yeah, I'm Stephen Bresna. So, I live in Wyoming, and I have a YouTube channel, Bullets for Bucks. It's all one word, the number four, so Bullets for Bucks. Uh, do hunting content, um, rifle reviews, optics reviews, and review other hunting equipment too, but uh -huh. kind of a combination of that stuff. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, I'm just going to shout out the chat real quick. Uh, go over it live. Um, the full hunting video will be coming out on his channel. I took a little footage I might post here and there, um, but uh, the full hunting video will be coming out on his channel. Uh, we got Dan O'Neill in here, great Patreon supporter. Thank you, Dan. He's a good good guy. Grizzly Crazy, Big E, what's up? Uh, he's working on a 243 Winchester Brass Prep. Cool. Um, and then let's see. Mr. F&H, Chooks Outdoor Adventures is here. Darth Yogi, Texas Patriot is here un under a new name, it looks like. Reloading Weatherby is here. Vanessa Kitty's here. Keith Gregory's here. Did you get some? <laughs> All right. <laughs> she just wants to cut straight to the point. Uh, we're going to talk about the hunt and go over it. And the full video will be on Steven's channel in about 18 months when he finally edits it. Right. Something like that. Uh, the earliest would probably be three months and the, and the latest would probably be six months. I could lie and say it would come out sooner. I do have, I've been posting like one or two shorts a day with just like clips of it already. Um, so there's already like little 15, 60 second depending on the clip just little clips kind of but uh yeah the full full edited hunt video will it'll be a little bit because i'm going straight from this basically into wyoming's hunting season and so it'll be like the end of november before hunting stops for me to where i can start kind of catching up on editing and stuff but i do have two videos a day coming out every day every week or two videos a week coming out every week cool all right, Jason. Uh, Jason's a good guy. He helps me with the cameras a lot. Um, afternoon. How was the trip? It's good to see you. All right. They're all looking forward to it. So my whole audience, Montana Musings here, has also got a little good channel. Go check them out. Um, my whole audience here wants to see the video. So there's going to be some pressure on you to get that done. I might have right. to rush it a little bit. Yeah, you might have to be or, in the back of your camper in Wyoming on your elk trip, typing up yeah, some. You get my, I can get the, I got to get some Starlink, the RV Starlink going or something. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So teaser videos as to whether you filled the freezer. Yeah. All right. G33, good to see you. Martin Horse, good to see you. All right. So let's talk about this trip. So it took you how many days to get to Anchorage? Like, uh, Oh, uh, to the flight. So I left Sheridan, I don't know, three o'clock in the morning and I got to Anchorage. Well, what it was uh, what five o'clock. I don't remember. Mm -hmm. Basically one whole very long day of traveling. A um, couple layovers, a couple different flights. Um, and the airline so wonderfully did a great job keeping your yeah content with you didn't they yeah i had a carry on with most of my camera gear um and then i had the checked in rifle and a checked in large bag which of course was over 50 pounds so you got to pay like a hundred dollars extra for that um but they lost the the one they lost the backpack with like a hundred percent of all necessary backpack hunting gear essentially and i didn't get it till originally they didn't even know where it was um, and it's weird cause I got the rifle at the last second when I, they, they originally didn't have that either, but at the last second I got that. And then like, you know, at two o'clock the next morning, I got a, a phone call saying they had found the other bag. It, it ended up, it was on the wrong flight. It went to like some other state down South before it got returned back and somehow it was on the wrong flight. So somewhere between, um, Alaska airlines and United, it was misplaced but i got it i got it the next day so that was important because it would have been irreplaceable kind of yeah very good very much so um so you got here uh he he, he picked got a hotel for himself for the night and then i'm you can call it that <laughs> yeah he, in los anchorage he found the hooker motel and paid the cheapest motel um <laughs> is that about right 
Yeah, yeah when I picked you up, there were some nice there, people in the park, parking lot. Yeah, it was, there uh, was a novelty store next to it. Didn't yeah. know that. And then there was a group of people getting drunk in the parking lot the first night. But yeah, it was it was interesting. It was all right though. Um, it, it worked, I guess. All right. Vanessa Kitty says she was stuck in SeaTac on October 30th, 1982. She remembers the date. Anchorage had raging storms. Got there at October 31 in the evening with no winter gear from Louisiana. Fun. Um, I think, Vanessa Kitty, you were in the military up here, right? Um, anyway, 29 watching and 9 thumbs up. Come on, people. Oh, thanks, G23. Appreciate it. Um, anyway, so, like, I pick you up. We go to the range. Mm-hmm. And uh, I got burned severely by somebody with a, a M1 Garand next to me. It got a nice little burn. Yeah, pull your finger. There you go. Yeah. Can you it doesn't look as impressive though on there. It doesn't. Yeah. And it's it, been a, a week or more. Yeah, it's so. been. A, so, but anyway, that was that was fun. I ended up being friends with them though. They let me shoot the Garand. It, it, at least they could do it if they burn me with their brass is let me shoot it right, and they let me Man. shoot it, and we we had a good time. So. Um, at first, I kind of thought he was being a sissy because he's like brass burn me. Because normally, a brass burns you. It's just kind of like a little tiny bit of redness. Yeah, it's not a big deal. But then I was, it, it was actually pretty significant. Like it was like a good second or second degree burn, like Absolutely. a good one. Yeah, it was good. It's the I worst, don't... worst brass burn I've ever had. I, it's one of the worst I think I've ever seen. Yeah, and, you know, other than those that go down like a flat jacket in the military. Yeah. Which, you know, I was never in the military, but I've heard about those. I've so. had pistol down there, but like pistol, but that's not, it doesn't, it didn't ever burn me that bad. It wasn't as hot, I guess. Yeah. So, but, um, and I, let, I dropped my driver's license there. That was interesting because they take your driver's license at the range, but yeah. Um, <laughs> so the hotel you got, you could apparently rent by the hour, just so you know. Well, so I can't say everything, but. I got, I paid a taxi, which was a mistake because it turned out they had a shuttle, but they wouldn't answer their phone. So I didn't know they actually had a running shuttle because I called the hotel and they wouldn't answer their phone at motel, I should say. And so I ended up getting a taxi and the taxi driver was a real character, of course. And he starts off by telling me a story about basically picking up a hooker at that hotel and having, you know, you know, making love in in the bed. And and it was like, oh, that's great. And I don't think he was choking. Um, And then, uh, then I did get a shuttle the next day to pick up the bag that came in, you know, my the missing bag. And that guy had another story about all kinds of stuff. And that was that was also interesting. Uh, it wasn't uncomfortable for me, but there was a, a, a lady that didn't seem like she fit in the back that I think was really freaking out. But it was all good. Yeah. Oh, gosh. The side chat here is, uh, you know. <laughs> not oh, going well with the, well give, give your quarter to the the, the, the taxi bed. driver literally said they broke the bed in that motel like the, like that's what he claimed all right let's gonna keep this bed. g-rated now um anyway he's getting uncomfortable so. <laughs> yeah no i ate um, chinese next door too so it's really high quality there nice you go. kitten in there yeah um so anyway we go to the range you come over you sleep on an air mattress that i borrowed here and uh, he's been a, he's been a good sport. My wife and I didn't clean the house as well as we should have. Um, so he's been a good sport and everything we get up and, you know, you finally have to work on your house for your yeah. new house. You finally got some sleep that night, didn't you? Yeah. I don't think any, I mean, yeah. So I spent two weeks straight, no days off doing like 16 hour days, remodeling a house and then moved the weekend before I flew out here. And, uh, that wasn't how it was supposed to go down. It's just life events made it that way. Um, but I, I did. I got like the first good night of sleep I'd gotten in like a month or two yeah. on that on the air mattress that before we went out, which was good because if that hadn't happened, it'd been rough. But right. So we uh, we get everything finally going. I don't think we leave till like noon 30 at my house. 1130. 1130 I think it was something like that. Yeah. And so we drive all the way to, way to Fairbanks. Um, and uh, Stephen, you had a little health concern. He wanted to make sure he wasn't sniffly sick or anything like that. So you got a hotel in Fairbanks. Thankfully, even though it was the cheapest hotel in Fairbanks, it was nice for the money. It was decent. it was super clean, super and they clean. were it was nice. I mean, uh, yeah. uh, for the price of things up there, it was like a hundred a night or something, which is cheap for there. And it was uh, and I was a little more than that, but it wasn't bad. Five, I think you said it wasn't bad, and it yeah. was really clean. So I think it was it was it was good. Take a to pace ourselves. Yeah, was it a heart? Oh my goodness! You guys are just awful. All right. Well, now I know what I need to talk about because apparently it gets views. Yeah. Um. 
So anyway, Montana, Steve, we'll, uh, we'll get back to your questions there. Um, that's that. Um, <laughs> y'all, are, y'all are not right. You guys are not right. All right. So we, we didn't do anything broke back mountain. I was quite disappointed. Um, yeah, you know, uh, so whatever. Uh, we didn't sleep in the same bed. No, Lord. no, no. I had to make uh, get a roll away for me. So I had yeah. a little match bed this big and a mattress this thick on a roll away bed. Yeah. Um, so I was that. Um, anyway, um, we drove to Prudhoe Bay the next day. We drove to Prudhoe Bay. Our plan was just to drive until we saw caribou along the hall road. And then once we started seeing caribou, then we would make our plan on how far out we would go, uh, we where we would attack the five mile boundary and get out. And we didn't see caribou until we were it, five, ten miles or less from Prudhoe Bay. Yeah, seven miles or so uh, south of Prudhoe Bay. And then we finally started, but it was a little bit overcast and rainyish. Um, and uh, yeah, so we basically went all the way to Prudhoe Bay before seeing caribou, got gas, um, and then. I slept in the tent. He slept in the car, and then uh, the next morning we pack raft out. Base or yeah, pack raft. So Onyx has been great. He had Onyx on his phone. I I was always one of those. Oh, yeah, I don't need that. I can guesstimate or I can get a map. I'm I'm badass. My job for in my head. Um, yeah, Onyx has been great. So uh, Steven's been working them for a while. So um, we found on the maps, or uh, he found on the maps a way to pack raft into the five mile boundary because the sag river has many braids or branches of it and they twist throughout there and uh we could get on one branch hop over to another go to this one and as long as we got on the branch all the way by the bluffs and stayed on it we could we could get out the five miles without having to uh actually walk and hike so we did that i bought a brought a cheap uh bass pro uh scent paddle uh, for the pack raft and when i flipped it it completely broke um i lost my rifle uh was able to find it in the river <laughs> so my 65284 that i love so much um and so i was it we were able to find that so that that put a damper on things but when that paddle broke i decided hey i have a small pack raft steven has my larger pack raft i have the alpaca caribou steven had my explorer 42 all right uh, if you guys are um, going to get a pack raft for hunting purposes, don't get less than the Explorer 42 um, from Alpaca. Um, and uh, it was. Uh, yeah. One thing to note, if you guys ever try it is, well, first of all, it is a lot of it's a lot, a lot of driving. So I would I would pace myself. Everybody's got a different opinion on it, but it's a lot of driving to be aware of. There's of course, there's not a lot of gas stations. So get gas where you can. Um, the gas prices actually weren't that bad in, in, in except for like Prudhoe Bay. Um, but the, it's to be expected in Prudhoe Bay. Right. It was eight, eight over $8 a gallon in Prudhoe Bay. Yeah. And it was over seven fifty in cold foot. Yeah. The, so. the SAG, or, which is just, the, I guess, the short for it, um, is not one river. You know, it's like, I don't even know how places it's probably like 13 different branches. Of yeah. It, you know? It's like three main rivers and then branches in between those three main rivers, maybe. And it branches off. Um, the biggest problem is, is if you take it all the way out, you'd have, you end up, you can't, you have to hike back, but we'll get into that. Yeah. Um, the, the tundra between the branches of the Sag river, if you ever do go out there and hunt or actually like from where we were at the branch, the land in between and the river bottom is actually really easy to hike compared to regular tundra on the uh, right side, uh, which is pretty good intel. Yeah. Um, it was that wasn't bad. Uh, once you get above the bluffs, it gets a little bit worse. Yeah. Um, so we hunted near the Franklin Bluffs. We got out. We ended up getting out only four miles before we decided to make camp and leave camp where it was. Um, and so we camped in the little creek ravine in the Franklin Bluffs. Bluffs. Uh, four miles from the. Uh, road so um and then once we got there we went out that night and spotted caribou we went up over the mountain uh the bluff and hiked and hiked and hiked and you know we were over a mile out and we saw a cow and a calf and you saw a couple bulls that night right yeah a couple of smaller bulls there so like the the rafting in 
um, we drug, we, you were going with the current and so it wasn't too bad, but there still was a fair amount of pulling your raft rather than paddling to get in there. Um, so it was still pretty physical. And then, you know, maybe up to deepest, maybe knee deep, except for maybe a couple areas. Of course, he did flip his and break his paddle. So that was, it was rough. It was rough going at first, but, um, and that's partly why we didn't go the, cause you can actually take that branch of the river all the way past the five mile boundary, but every mile you go further, you have to backtrack further to get back to where you can get out. And that's something to be aware of. Like you can't raft it out really, at least from what we can tell, unless you end up in the ocean. Um, so you have to go against the current every mile you go in, basically you have to go back till you can get down to where there's uh, the, a branch going towards the road. And then you can, then you can float back out, but you're backtracking miles and miles and miles against the current pulling a raft that, I mean, probably uh, with the caribou, maybe 150 pounds or something in a backpack. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, we got four miles in and then you could just go 50 yards up from where we were camped on top and you could start to glass. Um, and so I went, maybe a mile in um the night we got there we i think we took like a dinner break we took like a three or four hour break and we then did. it stay it basically never gets dark like i'm not used to that at all like at all but it basically never got dark um and so we were out till pretty basically i think 12 even that night um mm -hmm. and am and uh you could glass everything was pretty far out though especially that first night there was nothing that came remotely in shooting distance at all, or even really where you can make a play and we were already pretty spent. Um, but, uh, yeah. So we got back to the camp and we slept in the next day. Mm -hmm. uh, we slept in till 12, 1230, something like that. And we didn't start hiking yeah. over the mountain again till 1 PM. We did. Yeah. We did like an uh, early afternoon and we went back out, um, which I think pacing yourself, I think it was the right decision. And then um, the weather was pretty decent, um, went out, got a, the fog cleared. It really, a lot of times I noticed maybe that it's just that far north is the fog didn't really clear till late morning or even early afternoon anyway. So it was kind of best to wait for it to clear. So we went up and it was it cleared by that time. And I was using some Vortex uh, Fury uh, AB binos. Um, if you guys have any questions, of course, you can ask. And um glass caribou out i mean they were we went up i think we started a mile in there were we well we sat we went about a mile in or, or what we thought was i think it was just under a mile in and a pretty decent side i didn't think anything was going to come close everything was way out like three four or five miles out and a bull caribou literally came around the corner at like 400 yards came into 320 and it was a decent bull um but it was facing directly at us the whole time it barely even quartered. And then I was set up waiting for it to broadside. It just wheeled and sprinted. I'm talking like a dead sprint before ever any good shot opportunity. I tried to make a play on it, go around again, got almost set up at 400 yards on it. And it just a dead sprint again. And I don't know, like it, it's debatable what happens. Uh, I watched caribou do that all day, even like four miles away. So I don't know what was going on, why they were behaving that way. Um, or if it was us, but I chased it for a little bit. And the, man, let me tell you, those caribou can move through the tundra. I mean, they go a thousand yard. It feels like a few seconds. They're a thousand yards away. Yeah. Um, and they move, they never really stop moving. Um, like maybe an elk or a deer will stop for a long period of time. I never saw that. They just go. Mm -hmm. um, so that happened. And I think it was like an hour or two later. I saw we had a, well, that bull came up from the, well, we hiked a little bit further in mm -hmm. and then a bull came from the right, uh, that I didn't see till it was already like 700 yards out. And I tried to make a play on it and it just trotted away. I don't, you know, they just kind of keep moving. I could see it sprint from where I was. Yeah. yeah. It sprinted away. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it sprinted and, and then it, I went over a hill and then it was stopped and then it sprinted and then it, and it was, it, it was it, they just roam and they go really fast. And especially I think in the heat of the day or the mm -hmm. middle of the day, I should say, I don't know if it had anything to do with the heat or not. So then I went like farther and farther and farther. Cause I kind of, you know, I, I, when I'm after something, I go after it pretty hard. So I went way out. Yep. Leaving his out of shape hunting partner. 
Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, and uh, so I'm sitting there in that same spot where we had originally seen the bull after he had went after and chased it. I don't know, it was about 425 o'clock. I'm sitting there, and I thought I heard two gunshots, but I could not tell where they were coming from except they were coming from the east somewhere. And I knew he had curved uphill a little bit before I last saw him. So I started curving to my right uphill and I never found him. Uh, yeah. Never found him. Uh, <laughs> I shot up some ptarmigan. Uh, missed, but I shot at some ptarmigan. There are ptarmigan everywhere up there. Um, so I've never seen more ptarmigan in Alaska in my life. I, we there must, was a lot. There was I, there was jumped. a I mean, lot of a lot of dumb ones too. They're not very bright. They were... In the in the two in the day and a half we hunted up there, I must have seen, I've seen way more ptarmigan than in my entire life here in Alaska. Mm -hmm. um, so. so so kind of what happened is is I was trying to stalk on the one that had kind of paralleled and cut in front of us to out of out of range, and I was using the the Weatherby Backcountry 2.0 and 65 RPM which. It's okay. I haven't got amazing accuracy out of it, but it's an ultralight rifle, which is inherently hard for me to shoot. So I didn't really want to shoot anything beyond three or 400 yards max. Um, so I was chasing that one down and then I saw other bulls going into this valley. You know, it was like another half mile, mile out, but I, they were kind of coming in and I had chased that one far enough, essentially, that I was pretty, I was closer and there was like a little valley before that, which I had curved right a little bit. And then I'd gone down the valley and then around to try and make a play on the same bowl that I had been going on. I was trying to make a play on them still. And then these other bowls had worked into the valley and they were actually smaller. Um, and there was one that was kind of just going slower and not doing the sprint thing that all the other bowls were doing. He was just kind of like going across the valley. So originally I, he originally was going right to left and I tried to cut him off and he, I don't think it was me. He just literally, they're just random. He turned and he started going this way and he was just eating, eating. And so I tried to cut him off again. Well, I started paralleling him. If I can get in the camera like that, basically. And I just worked in at an angle. He was going this way. I worked in at an angle just slowly. I didn't crouch or anything. I just walked slow and he knew I was there the whole time, but they're, I don't, I, they're definitely not as intelligent or as weary as a, as an elk in my opinion. But anyway, I walked in, got to 420 yards and or right around 400 and then i, I laid it down put the put the gun on my pack you know to rest prone and uh he was at 420 broadside shot it uh hit him i think the first shot was the front shoulder because it looked like he couldn't walk he didn't really go anywhere he just stood there and then i actually shot three times at first i wasn't even sure when he said two i did sh i shot three times the other two shots were right right in like the heart area um and and then he went down right there. Um, so, yeah, I walked up hoop, hooting and hollering. And I turned around and I waved a game bag a whole bunch. And I saw him on the ridge. And I thought he was looking right at me because he was looking around. But he barely never saw I me. never saw him. And so he disappeared. And I, I cut up the – quartered up and cut up the caribou. And and yeah. then uh, eventually we, we eventually found each other. Yeah, something like 10 o'clock or – no, seven o'clock, eight o'clock when we found it's each probably, other. It's probably like eight. Yeah. And we're talking about wide. When we talk about going over the hill and stuff, these are wide open spaces that that they're they're deceiving how far they, they are. Or There's are no not. depth perception. Yeah, the depth perception up there. It's up on top of the Franklin Bluffs, if you want to look on a map next to the Sag River. Yeah. So he got his first bull. It's a uh, small caribou. Uh, but it's not a it's not a bad one. It's bigger than anything I've killed. Uh, Chook might have killed bigger, but um is what it is. I'm gonna He's emailed me a picture. I'm going to see if I can bring up a picture here. Uh, yeah, there we go. Um, so let me go back to stream. The picture doesn't really show the, yeah. all the antler. But yeah, it's it's a small. It'd be like a raghorn equivalent to like a raghorn uh, elk is what they'd call it. Um, I did, I could care less. when I After I shot it, it was funny. A bull came right up at 80 yards that was bigger, circled me, literally circled me for an hour straight at no more than 200 yards the whole time. That one left, as soon as that one left, a, another bigger bull came up to 40 yards and circled me for like 30 minutes and then left. And then after that, a cow, I pushed a cow towards where Chuck was without even really knowing it. Yeah, um, that that cow, that cow was the luckiest damn cow. I had even gotten my pack off to get my rifle off, but with me breaking my paddle to get out, we didn't think we could carry more than one caribou out of there. So I ended up not not letting my 6'5", 284 ring. 
And I, I let that cow go. And I just looked at her and said, you're the luckiest damn cow ever to live. This yeah. Yeah, yeah, you are. You have just darned yourself and lived cow. Yeah. You have just survival of the fittest is not you, but you got lucky. So, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I packed up the, all the meat. I think my pack probably weighed about 150 pounds. It's hard to know. It might, that might be over at least 120. I'd say 120 probably is better, more accurate. Yeah. And then I, I made it maybe thousand to 1400 yards. And it then, felt like a mile. And then we finally ran into each, each other. other. And then we went another, I don't know, mile and a half. I think it was between seven. I was between seven and eight miles from the boundary of the, from the road, I should say from um, Dalton highway and uh, maybe two to two and a half miles, probably from our camp yeah, yeah. where it was shot. Um, and I was using the Alps was it? it's the Alps, uh, Alps, um, shoot 2.0, but I forget it's something Alps 2, 2.0. It's an internal frame backpack. It worked good. Mm -hmm. I can't believe the straps didn't rip. Like a lot of backpacks, you get over like a hundred pounds and you're trying to get it on or sling it around. They'll, it, they'll start to tear. And so far that backpack is put up to that. And, uh, at least one other elk that I got with that as well. A bull elk. It's, it's been a, a good backpack for, for the money. Yeah. Um, and no, they yeah. don't pay me. <laughs> yeah. So when we met up, I, I ended up carrying the, the tenderloins and the head and stuff for them on my pack. Um, I don't know. It wasn't the Alps. It's yeah. the, it's the, uh, slumberjack. I have slumberjack. two, I have two Alps backpack. I can't believe it. Yeah. yeah it's a slumberjack, not the Alps. I do have two Alps backpacks. I was using a slumberjack backpack too. I was using yeah. the frame, external frame yeah. pack. Yeah. Slumberjack. Yeah. I can't believe I mixed that one so, up. Um, yeah. So anyway, um, so yeah, uh, he got his, uh, caribou and then, then came the work. Well, the next day we, there was an ice shelf that hadn't melted yet right next to the river. And we put the caribou on that. Uh, and I think that really did preserve a lot of the meat because it was great weather. It was like 68 to 75 degrees. Yeah, I got up the to next think, two days. I think so. it got up to 75, which mm -hmm. was kind of worrisome to me. But luckily, there was that ice shelf. It, it would have been gone by the day. The day after we left, I bet that whole ice shelf was gone because um, yeah. it was melting really quick. But we took a rest day. I mean, uh, carrying 120 pounds almost a mile and then the rest uh, probably 90 pound pack another you know mile and a half mm -hmm. in the tundra really really burns you up and then especially even processing people don't realize that processing an animal is actually very physical as well so you know going straight from processing it to that and it is is uh is a lot so i was like yeah we need to take at least a day and recuperate before we because i knew we were going to go against the current pulling rafts with and backpacking out mm -hmm. before we could float out so you went we went like i don't know if it was i actually need to measure it. it'll probably be in my full video i probably i'm going to try and take and make a map and like show where we went and stuff a little bit uh to mm -hmm. a certain degree um and get be better measurements but it's like it was like between it's probably like four miles or five miles of going like the wrong way down a river pulling a raft and then hiking and dragging pack rafts across tundra so i had like a 90 pound pack on or more and then dragging a raft uh, literally across the tundra which are pack rafts i gotta say i mean we literally went like almost a mile probably across tundra uh, maybe not 1200 yards across tundra mm -hmm. dragging a raft right through everything uh, and then we finally connected into the river channel that was going towards the road and then rafted up a couple of miles. And that was like really quick because the current yeah. was really good. It was like, it didn't feel like it, it was really like two miles. It felt like it was, the, it was the best part of the whole yeah, day. It, yeah. The day sucked. It was, a, it was a sucky day. Yeah. And, but the weather was the weather. We couldn't ask for better. The mosquitoes were bad, but you could not ask for safer weather. Like if the weather had been bad, I think it could have been very dangerous what we had done, but the weather was so good that it, yeah. it was nice. Yeah. It had it been cold weather. I mean, I, I went in over my waders once on the way out and had it been cold weather, it could have been a medical emergency, but since it was hot and 75 degrees, it was more of a, this feels good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let me go over my waders again, you know? Yeah. Um, but uh, because of that, um, we, uh, it was nice, but yeah, we had to drag, you know, several places. There were some places you could paddle upstream a little bit, but you know, those were 2% of the whole trip yeah. and got you 50 yards, you know, till you had to drag again. And and you're like pulling, like, I think, and I, I, I the bigger raft catches, I mean, it was, it sucked for both of us, but I had the bigger raft with more weight. So it's catching a lot of the current. 
So you're pulling that and then you're slipping in gravel uh -huh. and like knee deep water. And then you'd step in spots and then you're in mud a deep, like a, like a foot deep in mud and then also in the water. And there was some parts of the bank that would fall away uh -huh. as you're dragging it. There was one spot that like the whole time I felt pretty safe, except for there was one like 200 yard spot that I ran to where I start, I could, I wasn't, I was slipping into the water almost over the top of my waders. The wind was picking up and I couldn't, there was like a two or three foot bank was all, but I was so exhausted and I kept trying to get up on it. And every time I'd step on it, it would just literally fall away like pea gravel. And I almost went all the way in and it was like a drop off. And that was one spot that got pretty hairy. And then I, and I, I hurt my elbow and stuff, but it was fine. It was just like, uh, if the weather, like you say, if the weather had been bad, I think it could have been really risky. Um, but, uh, and I think, you know, there's there's better ways i'm sure yeah. but um but i think most of the better ways you have to pay for <laughs> yeah <laughs> but, like get flown out the five miles yeah. so but there are plenty of caribou in there uh we saw three bull caribou on the way in one was a really good one we saw all sorts of caribou along the road i'm gonna you know publish some footage of the caribou along the road um i think but um you know it's uh it's pretty nice um it's uh um just uh it's an interesting adventure. Um, you need to be in better shape than me. I had been riding my exercise bike, despite my fat appearance, uh, for a few several weeks beforehand, trying to get my body in shape, and I was nowhere near enough. Um, you need to be at, at, at the point where you can do, you know, 50 push-ups and run a mile and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And my, my leg condition didn't allow me to do those things, and I was out of shape, and I was quite, quite literally a whiny bitch the whole time, so... If um, you so like yeah. if you want an easier, less physical hunt, you can do the archery. Your chances might be lower because you're doing archery of success, but you could theoretically you could stay at the Aurora Hotel in Prudhoe Bay where they have meals and you can stay there. It's expensive and you could fly into Prudhoe Bay. That would be like the easiest, least physical, most expensive, most well, <laughs> well, not most expensive, most expensive, most expensive DIY, DIY yeah. style hunt. Mm -hmm. Um and you could just do like, you can rent a truck and you could do like road hunting basically. Right. And there are some caribou, especially cows, if, but as a resident or non-resident, you can't get a cow anyway, that were probably dumb enough. You could fill your tag in a couple of days with our treatment. And if you got floated back uh, uh, two miles in, we did run into a really kind of dumb, big bull. It was a, a good bull yeah. that just kind of hung around by the river and didn't seem to spook. So like you can fill a tag and it's less physical. I think your chances are still in a sense, in a way lower, um, unless you're really proficient in archery maybe. Um, but there's a reason why most people archery hunt it, and it's because it's, I mean, you don't have to go the five miles or deal with all the river crossings we did. Um, yep. but I will say this man, you know, Wyoming doesn't have any streams. This man took off to pack rafting. Like it was nothing, you know, 30 minutes on the water. He was controlling his craft way better than me. Now you actually had a better craft, but, um, my, yeah. I didn't break my paddle didn't break in half. <laughs> yeah, you didn't have a you didn't bring it. He came to here and bought a a, a great paddle at a Alaska mountain hike. Yeah, there. if you if you if you get a paddle, if you're gonna do something like that where your life could be like in jeopardy, get a get a good carbon fiber paddle, and maybe even one with a carbon fiber blade, um, and then with the back rafts, um, I think what was was it 215 centimeters. Get at least a 215 centimeter or longer paddle so that you can clear the tubes, the inflated tubes on each side without like bumping into them as you're trying to paddle. Um, but like having it to where you can float out obviously is better because you're gonna have way more weight going out than in if you fill your tag. Mm -hmm. um, and then or have some sort of transportation service in an area where you can float out uh, without having to hike as much. Um, yep. but it's, I think this early in the season, there That's wasn't, an, yeah, yeah, there wasn't like an easy option unless we paid $3,500 a person, at, uh, to fly or something like there wasn't a, a really easy rifle option. Um, if you had more guys with you or a bunch of in shape guys, then hiking the five miles. And if you got one caribou, then everybody splits the meat probably wouldn't be too bad, but it, there was like probably no real easy way to fill a tag with a rifle this time of year. No, um, um we had originally were going to walk in farther south. Um, we were going to walk in 
to where the sag and the ish meet and the five mile boundary is somewhere right around in there. And you got to go up the ish a little bit to, uh, to get it. And, um, and, uh, it was, um, we just didn't see any caribou that far South. And so we, we were no. thinking, you know, had we done that and waited a couple of days, the caribou would have showed up because they were moving South when we found them. Yeah. Um, we would have seen caribou, uh, you know, but we wouldn't have seen the, the dozen or more caribou we saw while hunting. Um, we wouldn't yeah. have seen that many I, and yeah. our chances for success would have been slimmer and we might've might still be in the field. We uh, originally plan original plan. We'd still be in the field today. You know, like we'd be pack rafting out today or something, yeah. you know, the weather um, during the actual hunting during the actual in the field hunting was the best we could have asked for in Alaska. I think, um, mm -hmm. the, like, I don't, yeah, I don't think that could have been any better. It, it got the lowest it got was maybe like 28 the first night or the second, it was actually right. We, we yep. can't buy the car. Um, mm -hmm. It only, actually the one day it was like too hot to sleep basically. Yeah. Um, and like, yeah, you got to be where they are to find them. I don't think that's where they were. They were all the way up towards, you know, Prudhoe Bay, which makes it, you know, more physical if you're going to rifle hunt, I think. Um, I think, I mean, he could have, he could have shot three or four caribou. We could have filled more tags, but it would have been unwise uh, given our pack out situation there is no way so. um somebody's asking do you think the one that busted winded or uh something else spooked he him? made a lot of noise when he was getting in position he was talking in a regular voice and everything i'm gonna blame the one that busted on him uh i have heard and seen caribou bust from talking before um, um courtney's caribou hunt if you want to go back and watch that video guys were dragging uh uh canoes up the river while we were while caribou were crossing and it busted her hunt <laughs> it, kind of funny though i mean um those guys scared the caribou away then scared a moose and uh cow and calf away to the caribou which scared the caribou back to us mm. it's like you can't make that stuff up but you go look at the, my video on it from several years back of, called courtney's caribou hunt my wife um so we uh uh uh, I have seen him before, so I'm going to blame it on Stephen and him talking about it. I'm sitting here whispering, like, don't do this. Bah, 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 bah. He's going, hey, what do, you, what do you think it's out of bed? But yeah, so anyway. And, I uh, disagree. Uh, but uh, <laughs> yeah, disagree, I'm going to throw him under the bus there. Yeah. Um, and also on his Onyx, he'd be like, oh, it's only two miles away. Okay, let's go. Two miles later. Oh, it was only four miles away. Hey, let's go. But, you know, he was. Uh, well, I, I had to motivate him because, you know, he's fat. So, yeah, I, I had to, like, tell him it was 800 yards so that he'd go and say, saying if it's 1600 yards, he might just, like, cry. But, yeah, there's, there's a good uh, possibility I would I, cry. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, actually, it was 800 yards. Then I cried. And then he would tell me, oh, do you haven't been 800 yards yet? It's another 400 yards. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, no, it's that. That's that. So. Um, yes, it, uh, there, as we were driving out of, uh, Prudhoe Bay, there was a sign on the road that said 494 miles to Fairbanks. Uh, most people don't understand that more than half the state is north of Fairbanks. So, yeah, um, yeah, if, I mean, if you drew a, a line across the half of, you know, the Alaska, Fairbanks would still be in the Southern half. Um, if you would, uh, if it's possible to do that, um. But uh, because it's so oddly shaped. But uh, that's that. Uh, what's up, Clover Tack? How you doing? Um, so yeah, do you think you did it? Yeah, I, I'm I'm doing that. Somebody had a good point in here. Um, Wes Barkus, he's a good guy. Uh, caribou will sometimes turn and run like that because of mosquitoes. How bad are they this time of year? Uh, the first two nights days they were non-existent, and I was like, dang, we got up here. Because um, one of the things I read about the Central Arctic Herd is they tend to start moving when the bug activity goes down. Um, so when the mosquito yeah. activity and the first two days, we were like, yeah, good. And as soon as I sat down next to him to start glassing on the next day, bam, mosquitoes everywhere. Yeah, they were really bad. They were really bad. The last two days. Yeah. As far as it's spooking, I mean, it isn't worth arguing about there. I think that like. My my opinion was that it saw us because it was facing us and there was sun reflecting off of my scope and stuff. Yeah, it's but at possible. the same time, once I started observing other caribou movement, I was like, there was caribou two miles away, literally doing the exact, exact same, same thing. thing. Yes, there were. Where they would stop and then sprint and then 
a, like a 800 yard stop in this first. So it could have been a completely random. Um, I don't think it was talking because I had other caribou near me later on in the hunt that I literally started yelling at one and it wouldn't run away. And then another one I was talking to and calling it names and it wouldn't run away. But they knew um, you had already filled your tag. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I think caribou are kind of dumb. They'd like, sometimes it's like they would, I don't know. Like, I feel like they came into sight and came into sound and came into stuff more than they went away from it. But then they were super random. Like there was no logic to their movement that I could tell, like, like normally there's logic to an elk's movement or logic to a deer's movement. And most of these caribou were like, a uh, sprint, like dead sprint, stop, eat for a few seconds, dead sprint in a different direction, stop, eat, and then dead sprint in different. And it was like, what is going on? Except for the one I shot, that one was the one the reason I shot. It, it was kind of consistent. Um, but even that one zigzagged a little bit, but, uh, you know, their, their behavior was bizarre to me. Um, the, the, the topography in a weird way was similar to uh, pronghorn hunting as far as how they use the curvature of the land or you don't see stuff, um, except for the fact that it, it's when you step on it, it's spongy and lumpy, not like where you hunt uh, antelope. But, um, All right, Martin Horst has a good question for you here. Stephen, was Alaska what you expected was an experience that changed or exceeded your expectations? Um. I think it was mostly what I expected, to be honest. I think that I didn't, I mean, like I never had walked on Tundra and there was, I think it was actually a little bit where we went. I think it was a little bit easier than I thought it was going to be. I agree. Yeah. Um, especially between like in the river areas, like at, uh, where I thought it would be the worst was actually like not, it was like gravel and hard pack. It wasn't bad. Um, the... Uh, I thought I'd see way more animals though. Like where I live in Wyoming, I actually see just more wildlife in general on a daily basis. Um, the mountains were more majestic than I thought they were going to be. And there was more mountains. Like I thought Anchorage had mountains and like the Brooks range was mountains, but there's kind of like, there's, a, there's hills and stuff all in between. So like it might not be a mountain per se, but it's very, it was way more hilly than I thought in areas. It was more mountainous than I thought it was going to be in areas. Um, I think those things were kind of as ex uh, other things were kind of as expected. Um, but I did expect to see more like wildlife on the drive than we saw. Um, of course we saw tons of muskox, uh, right tons off the road. Muskox. Yeah. Um, some right off the road, right on the road, just about. And then several on the islands in the Sac river. And it's like yeah. Chuck is getting involved in archery and is going to get involved in a, get, trying to get a muskox tag. Up yeah. There. Once you got to mile marker 312 and north of that, there was muskox all along the road, um, which I didn't expect to see any of those. So that was cool. And uh, yeah, I'd never seen a mild, wild muskox before yeah. our trips. So. They're definitely not used to getting hunted. I don't think they issue very many tags because they're like, I mean, you could be 20 yards from one and it's just acts like you're not there. Kind of like buffalo doing Yellowstone, except for I think buffalo are more, uh, or bison are more aggressive. Um, but yeah, I mean, Alaska was in some ways what I expected. The mosquitoes were kind of what I was told they were. Um, it was, it was initially, I, it, we, well, we went further north than I thought we were, and I was sidetracked on the ho uh, stuff at home. So I didn't really pay attention to where we were going, but I think it was it was warmer later in the hunt than I thought it was, but at the start it was actually colder. So I expected it to be like in these forties and sixties. And instead it went from like 30 to 75. So it kind of varied greater than I thought it might. Um, it rained a lot except for a couple days. So it, like, that was kind of what I've heard. Um, except for, I feel like we got the better end of the deal on, on the rain. Um, Gas was cheaper everywhere south uh, from Fairbanks South. It was cheaper than I thought. In fact, it was about the same price as Wyoming, which blew my mind. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Anchorage was more was more uh, cityfied than I thought was hoping it would be, and there was more crazy and weird people than I thought there might be. Um, but yeah. Uh, Alaskan ballistics. What is a rough estimate for a hunt on Kodiak Island? If you don't have 20 grand in the bank, don't even think about it. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, for, for me to hunt Kodiak Island, the only thing cheaper for me than you is the license. 
I got to get put in for the draw proper draw tag and buy the proper license. And I'm saving you hundreds of dollars over you. And that's it. All right. I still have to pay the guide service. I'd have to pay the ferry or the airline to get to Kodiak Island. I'd have to, um, um, you know, it, it'd be, it'd be rough. And it also depends on what you're hunting, you know, uh, while you're there as well. So good luck. So, Oh, and the one caribou that did bust or, either because of me or not because it does it, it actually turned out it was probably inside the five miles but i didn't know it so maybe it was meant to be yeah it was right on that boundary where it's hard it, to tell it, i think it was just inside of it according to onyx but we did, obviously i didn't know that at the time i was so close but um onyx was great uh <laughs> to use alaska gets mosquitoes <laughs> yeah alaska has more mosquitoes than any place else in the world guarantee it i will bet anybody on it um once you get north of Fairbanks and on that Dalton Highway, uh, the mosquitoes this year comparatively weren't bad to where me and my wife were you know, last year when we drove the Dalton Highway. Um, and they were bad this year in, in the spots, you know. On the yeah. on the day we left, they were the worst. And that, I think mentally they got to me a little bit finally because, I mean, I grew up in Michigan, so I was pretty used to mosquitoes. But the, the packing out and them constantly being on my face, um, not not really anywhere else, but in the face, and I ate a couple – this, well, I was so looks like air. a bruise is actually mosquito bites. You can't tell but here, but it's bunches of hundreds of little mosquito yeah, bites. So studio light whited it out. Yeah, but so yeah, I got a lot of mosquito bites on my right shoulder, my hands, and on the top of my head. And if you have a mosquito net pulled really tight against bare skin, I learned that some of them get through. They can bite you through it. Yeah, they're the Alaskan state bird, is what they people call a mosquito. So, but they're and, I, I wouldn't say they're like I've heard, I I wouldn't say they're like I think some people do a little bit over exaggerate them. Maybe I think that if you have a hundred percent deet and you have a mosquito jacket, like it's not a reason not to come. Like you'll be all right. Yeah. Like I don't know. Like and the, you know it, it's a good adventure, and I don't think it's as hard as people think. I mean, if you had the money, you could fly from. Friday, Friday Anchorage, Anchorage to Prudhoe Bay and blow money on renting a, there's a place that rents four by fours. And if you're good at archery, you could do the, it would be like really a pretty easy hunt. Uh, tra- you know, you take like two, two days of just flying. Um, but I mean, as far as physically speaking, it wouldn't be that bad. That'd be pretty chill. Um, you're just going to dish out more money or of course you could do the fly in thing, but, um, that would be yeah. even more. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I shot a muskox Canada because the musk tab is easy and harder to get a muskox in Alaska than Canada. Oh, wow. Good to know. Uh, how hard hmm. is it to hunt muskox? It's pretty hard to get a tag. Like, I'll be putting it, if I put in for a muskox tag, I'll be putting in for it for a few years before I get it. Um, possibly 20 years. Who knows? Um, the population, we saw over 70, 75 as yeah, far as population. Plenty and they like, mm-hmm. e- e- like you could easily get one with our tree equipment. Um, they're just not pressured. I don't think. Um, and I don't think their behavior is naturally all that, you know, they're not that bright necessarily. So getting one would be easy. The hard part is getting the tag, getting a tag would be. And then the harder part would be getting it out of there off the Sag river. Yeah, so, unless you, unless you just got one right next to the road, which is probably possible. Um, mm-hmm. So there's that. So mosquitoes in northern Minnesota wear red cross armbands. That's a, that's a bad joke. <laughs> that's a bad joke. <laughs> yeah, I got it. Um, don't bring so things that you that uh, don't bring headlamps or batteries at least not this time of year up there if you're going that far north if you're going that far north don't bring a headlamp or batteries it's a waste because you're not going to use it it's literally never gets really dark so you don't need a headlamp you don't need batteries for your headlamp um that's something to note uh i would agree with what he told me before which is of course have good waders um and and wading boots because it is you're especially if you plan on going on the right side like i should say the east side of the road uh, where the rivers are at, then definitely have waders and, and uh, even the the west side of the road had a lot of marsh. It was all marshy and yeah, you'd still want yeah. you'd still want something, uh, for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, the 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 main branches of the river had some deep spots. 
Um, I don't know how deep because luckily we didn't fall into the deepest spots, but I'm sure that you could you could go under. Yeah, you could go under um, and drown. You want to wear a life jacket, which we didn't do. I so. would recommend if I do it over again, I'll honestly bring one because mm -hmm. um, yeah. it, it would be the right thing to do for sure and the safest yeah. thing to do. Um, Absolutely. I also uh, make sure all your stuff strapped to your kayak really mm -hmm. good. So when it flips, it doesn't fall out. Yeah, Chuck. So oh, you might get a floating rifle holder. Or something. Yeah, they, they, there's a, a raft shop in town that offers a floating rifle holder. So um, I'll, I might go invest in a couple of those. Uh, definitely want the Explorer 42. So if we were going to do this again, we've been talking. Uh, we'd want two Explorer 42 alpaca pack rafts, two high quality K, uh, uh, paddles um, that are four piece break up. So you can put them in your backpack instead of two pieces, which, you know, stand out and stick on everything um but there's no trees up there to worry about it so um you'd want um you know the floatable gun case that's packed to your pack raft um and then you'd want to find a place where you can hike out you know three to four miles on the river and pack raft back in instead of pack rafting in and having to hike out uh with all your meat um because it's better to hack in my opinion to pack in with 70 pounds on your back than to pack out with 150, you know, yeah. um, even if you're dragging it in a pack raft or whatnot yeah. um, and stuff, but um, yeah. And if you, and if you're good with a bow, it's probably worth, and you, and you're not going to carry everything on your back at, uh, the whole time, you know, then it's probably good to try and bring a, a, a light bow and a gun or one person could bring a rifle and you could just agree to share it. And one person could bring a bow. Um, mm -hmm. That would probably would be, actually the smartest thing to do um yeah. and that way you can bolt you can hunt either or um because there was like that first big really nice bull that i went up to it gave me multiple opportunities had i had a bow um yeah that me probably, too yeah. Were probably very doable mm -hmm. um and that could have saved a lot of time and heartache too as well but um and i would actually that was a i would say a, a really solid bull um yeah I, it, mature, it was a mature bull it wasn't a record breaker, but it was a mature bull. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, but bring paracord because it's useful for all kinds of stuff. Clothesline, uh, you know, uh, extra lanyard to your your paddle or to your you know attached up to the boat. So if it does flip over, it doesn't float away. Um, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of uses for that as well. A um, couple lighters, of course, some good fire starters because it is really wet. And I wouldn't if depending on where you go, I wouldn't depend on there being wood to actually burn. Yeah, uh, you're in, in a river delta. You probably will find wash up stuff. But if you're actually out on the tundra, if you plan on going out on the tundra and like camping out there, you're not going to have wood to burn. I'm just you're probably not going to have anything to burn. Yeah, we because we set up cramp camp in a creek that flew uh, flowed into the Sag River. There was a lot of wash up roots there. Um, we probably went through a third to maybe a half of everything that was there in three days making campfires. Yeah. And they weren't even huge fires. I mean, yeah. they were just like. And I had always used those rim oil wipes to start a fire with uh, a striker. I couldn't get it done. We had to use his stuff. Like, I, I think maybe my rim oil wipes had gotten a little soaked or something. But um, normally, I, you know, I did that in the spring on my bear hunt. Uh, just you know use a striker i didn't bring my blackbeard fire starter striker so link in the description there's my shield for the night but um uh yeah i didn't bring that striker which is a lot better but um i brought the striker that was with the tops yeah. knife that uh daniel raven star gave me over on patreon and um so i appreciate I've, him but. i've been using just there's two types actually two different brands of fire starters that are like they look like little white bricks like that big they come in a plastic wrap you can get them at walmart or like i think sportsman's and i just they're like actually the cheaper ones because they're super lightweight and you just light the wrapper you don't like you just light the wrapper on fire i've been using those in winter in, in wyoming stuff for years and they i keep a bunch of those and they seem to work really good um in no, almost no matter what weather as long as you can get them lit um and then uh, I'm just trying to think of what else. Oh, you need a good rain jacket, of course. Yep. Um, Thankfully, we didn't need it. If you, hunt, but if you can it. afford a Cerakoted rifle with a, a stock that, like, you know, a rifle that's weatherproof, obviously that's better because it's going to get wet either in the river or it's going to get wet from rain. Mm -hmm. um, 
Uh, so, you know, weatherproofness is good. Um, you do deal with more fog. I feel like, like even on the, um, binos I had, I had to wipe the lenses more. So, you know, we, I, we definitely had more humidity there than we, you do in one. Yeah. Area. So yeah, that, if you don't hunt in humidity, it's something to it's think not about. like Georgia, Louisiana humidity, but it, there's more humidity there um, than like Wyoming or something like that. The caribou itself was like bigger than a whitetail for sure. Maybe I would say it's like slightly bigger than a mule deer. There might be some really mature mule deer about the same size, but it's it's like maybe slightly bigger than a mule deer as far as the body size. Um, so that gives you a little bit of maybe something to reference it by. Mm -hmm. Um trying to think if there's which else hello brother yeah smash time i'm not i'm probably not going to iv88 right now uh medical debt man you know got to pay that off before i can start hanging out again um but next year i plan on going to iv8888 yeah um so sorry about that my brother so um but yeah Steven from Bullets for Bucks, successful caribou hunter, successful Alaskan hunter. Um, so, guys, uh, go subscribe to his channel. Um, that's Bullets with the number four bucks. Uh, he's been on the chat before, you know, but, you know, last time he's on the chat, he's been uh, sitting in Wyoming instead of sitting in Alaska. So, everybody, go subscribe to him. Great guy. Absolutely wonderful man. Go subscribe to him. And um, sorry, ladies, he is married. <laughs> um so um but anyway um and uh y'all are expecting right so yeah, yeah so congratulations January. congratulations there's gonna be another little bullet for buck running around mm -hmm. you know a little bull little yeah. bullet but running well, we around, don't know what so. it, it's gonna be a bull or a doe yet we don't know yet but yeah we'll it's still out. it's still a bullet it's still a little yeah. bullet for bucks um running around so um guys rifle just koozies rifle <laughs> koozies yeah um you know, well, somebody's already making them. So, um, but uh, if if they quit making them, Martin, you, you email me. Let's get together because uh, I I know what I want, and you might know how to design it. So uh, we could make a business together on that. Um, so that's that. Um, bending ballistics, thanks, guys. Uh, there's a lot of people that have uh, channels in the chat. Smash time, G23, bending ballistics. Um, uh, a few other people have channels in the chat. Uh, make sure you go check them out. Text Patriots Lever Guns 50 is a great guy. Uh, we're going to try to get him up here for Moose someday to, to hunt with his 5110 lever action. Hmm. Um, so most people have heard of 4570. Shooters have heard of 4590. I didn't hear 5110 until I met Lever Guns 50 on YouTube here. So that goes relating chambers in here. Uh, Grill HD is supposed to be starting his channel soon, hopefully. When are you going to get that astronomy channel, man? I wrote you some music for that, and that was a good music I wrote, too. Um, so, anyway, uh, Clover Tax in the house. Make sure you check him out. Um, Mr. FMH. Yeah, so go go back in the chat. Check everybody out. Um, all 2A. Warsaw Patriot. All 2A people got to, you know, uh, support everybody. 2A EDU. Good friend of the channels up here. Um, so check out our links in the description. Link to his channels in the description. It's also one of the first in the uh, uh, chat. So anyway, guys, God bless. Take care. We will see you at the range.